Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and uh, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Tonight we are, have the privilege of uh, hosting Dame Zaha Hadid. Um, as usual, uh, I will start off with a few questions of my own before opening it up to the audience um, for some of your own questions, of which I am sure there, there will be many. So, um, Dame Zaha, thank you once again very much for coming here. You don't have to call me Zaha. Oh, okay. <laughs> Zaha. Yeah, Zaha. Yeah. Um, Recently, you became the uh, only woman ever to win the prestigious Royal Gold Medal. But you, of course, have been honoured in so many ways in so many countries. Was this a particularly significant honour for you, or, or, or are all honours you receive equal? No, I mean, this obviously for me was very important because uh, I chose to live in this country, I chose to practice in this country, I studied in England and in the UK, so... Um, so I think it was very important for me that, you know, I am honoured here, so to speak. And, and was this perhaps more significant because uh, you were the first woman to win Actually, the Actually, I didn't even know that I was the first woman to receive the, Pris to the, the Prisca as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the gold medal, I, I found it difficult that it was taken that long for a woman to receive an award like that. When you say you find it difficult, what, do you mean that's surprising based on your experience of the industry? No, or? I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I thought, I mean, I think, that, of course, there were other women who won it, but they were partnered with a male, so, you know, they considered sort of not the same way. So I, was, I, I didn't realise there was a statistic that says no woman had won it. I didn't know that. And so is that because, so when you say you're surprised, I mean, have you ever worked particularly with other people in the same way? Well, it's surprising that and, and it's taken that much time for a woman to receive an, an honour like the gold medal when there are many practising female architects. Of course. And, and you, you've said that there will only be gender equality in the world of architecture uh, when women are included in golfing days out and guys' dinners and No, in that way. I mean, I, don't, I think it's very difficult. I can say that personally, it's very, for me to this day, there are certain certain world I cannot uh, be part of, and and it makes it kind of difficult to, to be involved in the. I mean, if I was doing a cultural building, I think it's easier. But if I'm doing a corporate work or stuff like that, which requires some smoothing and you know partying or whatever it is, it, you have to be part of the club. And uh, no matter what, I'm I'm not. And maybe eventually it will change. Uh, but in, I'm talking specifically about the UK. I, I think I'm sure it's in other countries is different. And does that mean, therefore, you prefer cultural work rather than cultural no, I don't, work? No, I, I, I don't mind doing either way. It doesn't make any difference to me. Um, the main difference between architecture and other forms of art um, is the practical element of the work. What do you do when you have to compromise your design for practicality? I don't like the word compromise uh, to start with. <laughs> because, you know, I think that, um, you know, we know we are kind of professional and we know that in every project you have to be quite uh, kind of um, smart in the way you can interpret the work to suit the client or the requirements or the requirements of the city or planning or whatever it is. Uh, I've known for a long time that as long as I maintain the ideas, the central idea to the project and I can adjust the work to suit, then I think it's not, it's not in common. Sometimes, in some cases, actually, it, it makes the work better uh, if, you, if you have to go around a certain problem. Uh, you know, so I think there is always a demand to... I, th I think for a long time people did not respect the profession of architecture and it was seen as a service and it was like the duty of the architect to always kind of dumb down the idea. But I think you can still maintain the central idea, but you can, you can make it work. So can you think of a particular example to share with us? I mean, I think that, for example, when we, very early on when we were doing the Vitra fire station, I mean, the budget was very small. It was kind of, at the time, the engineering was quite, you know, it was very difficult, not difficult, kind of ambitious uh, structural project. And, you know, we had to kind of really uh, reduce the elements to only the most required elements. So every element in the project acts as a structural element and there was no other access. So let's say 
You want to kind of, there was no decorative elements. So it was purely based on structure and requirement of spatial requirement. And that, you know, one can achieve these things through that. But, uh, you know, I think you come across it many times, you know, whether, uh, you know, in, in, in project you have to change, uh, you have to reduce the budget. I mean, of course, somebody said to you, reduce the budget by half, you must be, can't do it. But if you can reduce it by a bit, then you can. And you just spoke about uh, something from earlier in your career. Um, what's changed in terms of how you approach new projects, if anything? Has, has anything changed in terms of how you approach things over the last 30 years? No, I mean, of so? course, you know, uh, in the office, the, the team has changed. I mean, we were 10 people, and now we are 400 people. So uh, the, the dynamic is not the same, you know? And, uh, and also, the work method has changed. You know, before, we used to do, let's say, a lot of sketching and model making and, and painting. And now it's a lot of it's done kind of through computer. computer. Not, not because it, the computer is taken over, it's just that it's a different method of work. It might come up with a similar product, but I think it's different. And, you, and, sorry, and, and also, I'm, I always believe in teamwork, so <clears throat> it's not that, you know, there's kind of the hand of the master and then the others will work it out. It doesn't work like that. It works like you know, a group of people, as a team, come together, they put ideas together and we test them out and see what works best. And so you just spoke about the you know, role of computers and the changing methods through, through which architects work. Are there ever times where you just sit there and get a piece of paper and just start sketching? Because that's what I, I do sometimes, but I mean, I don't think anybody can sketch nowadays. Uh, you know, I, don't, I mean, I don't know, but uh, I think that, I mean, I think it's a, it's a dramatic change. You know, there was a lot of, um, it took taken a lot of time to master drawing, uh, so, and especially towards the late, uh, towards the in, 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 in 90s, uh, late 80s, and then I think with the digital work, uh, there was a moment when, the, like, when I, because I teach as well, people can do both, and even in the office, both kind of uh, analog and digital. Uh, but I think now it's mostly digital, and I think the method is different. You, you know, and you might reach a similar outcome, you know, but it's very different uh, dynamic in that sense. Do you think people should be able to draw as as well as people used to be able to? You know, I think it's a kind of a craft, and I, I like drawing, and um, I enjoyed the time when we all drew and made models and so on. But I think it's um, it's very difficult to resurrect the craft. You know, it's like, and also unless you do it extremely well and it's kind of innovative and it's advanced, I think it becomes, it becomes kind of almost like a, you know, doing an antique workshop, you know. So I think it, it uh, unless someone very consciously says there's a drawing, uh, you, you draw from the, beginning of, from the beginning of the first year in school and you do five years and you go to an office, you work for another 10 years on drawing and then you master it, I can't, you know, then, if somebody starts again trying to mimic, I mean, there's a lot of schools trying to mimic certain periods of schooling in the 70s and 80s, and it really doesn't work. It's, it's a bit nostalgic. And as far as I'm concerned, the whole drawing and painting workshops, let's say, and the work we did, done its job, you know, was, 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 was supposed to do and give us a kind of really a view on how to develop new ideas. So. That, that was achieved, so I think it's and, and when you take on a new project, um, obviously with architecture, every new building has a site. And with the surrounding buildings, do you try to fit in or do you do the opposite? Do you try to stand out? Uh, no, uh, neither, actually. I mean, I think that the, 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 work, uh, the work emerged from a new kind of urban condition. Uh, you know, modernism tried to look at kind of uh, the idea of zoning, which is kind of separating the programs. And it was started with a tabula rasa, which is an open palette, and you start from, this, from scratch. And uh, when I started uh, being a student, it was the idea of looking at the kind of a really, uh, a very dense urban context, and how to develop an, an architecture and urbanism within that domain. So it is on one hand kind of, uh, it seems very new, but on the other hand, it is quite contextual, contextual by without trying to mimic or imitate the surrounding. So you draw kind of ideas or 
uh, maybe certain things from the existing context or respond to it, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, the best example is, I mean, there are many projects, but Rome, for example, the Rome project would say, uh, on one hand, it's very new to the context, but on the other hand, it, it relied, uh, it kind of it adjusted to every angle on the side. So if you take, uh, so every line which kinked around related to an existing geometry on the side. So in that sense, it's very contextual. It's also what I call the field project. It's not an object, but it's an urban project. So it's a new field, which is uh, no longer just one single building, but a series of buildings. But in this case, they kind of overlap. So it, you do many things in one go. You do layering, which is layering like uh, archaeology. So you yeah, and layer the project and also adjust it. So and the idea came from that side but it does not look like the rest of the projects on the site. Um, if, if we may jump onto something else, which was the um, design you had for the Japan 2020 Olympic Stadium. Um, so you've spoken in no uncertain terms about the controversy surrounding that. Uh, can you just explain to us how you were told that the bid that had been accepted was no longer going to be Followed through on. Uh, well, I mean, Japan is a very, uh, the Japanese situation is a very interesting topic. Um, but, you know, we had won this project three years ago. And it was an international competition with major architects, you know, from all over the world. And, you know, we went to Japan. There was one, so we had a kind of an agreement with Japan Sports Council. We have a contract for the preliminary work, but it was always agreed that it would be always done with the Japanese firm, because they didn't want to, the Japanese firm not to be involved in this project. So, that, so we are kind of almost a partner with the Japanese office in Japan to do the work on this project. So we worked on it for another two years, and, and then they decided to go for a bid to price it, and we recommended an open bid for many contractors, even internationally. They refused, they only wanted a bid with only two Japanese firms, or four, whatever. So they, they, they got the bid a year ago, and there was a certain price, and of course there were ways to reduce the budget, or to, to, not the budget, to, to reduce the price. They reduced the size of the stadium, they, they on certain things. They did not want, they wanted everything they had already planned, which is 80,000 seats, and so on. So, we carried on, they chose the contractor, the contractor ordered the steels, and in July, we didn't, we only heard on radio, on television. I mean, no one called us. My, the guy who worked for us in Japan called us and told us that the, the Japanese Prime Minister had gone on television saying, this project is cancelled. And that was the first you heard of it? Yeah. And what did you do in response? Did you well, I mean, of course, we, you know, we tried everything to talk to them, but there was no response. We went to Japan. Uh, it was a kind of a blank. So, uh, I think, it, it, I mean, I say that openly, and I think, you know, I could be sued for it. It was obvious that it's not about the budget. It is clearly obvious they did not want a foreigner design a national stadium in Japan. And um, it, for me, it's shocking because I've always liked Japan. One of my face, first big shows were in Japan. My first publication ever was a Japanese publication. Uh, I have many close friends in Japan. I assure you, they're not my friends anymore. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all the architects whom I have supported, like Toya Ito, and I've always respected Maki and Izasaki and all these people. Uh, they, they did not stop demonstrating and making, you know, petitions and so on. But the irony, of course, nobody says that they all entered the competition and they lost. Okay? So anyway, uh, so now they do an, another limited competition between Ito and Kangakuma, and Kangakuma wins it. But he is using the design of our stadium, which is not the exterior, the design of the interior of the ball, as the basis of the project because he's doing it with the contractor which was our contractor. 
So it is necessary, our scheme, but it's covered with something else. Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not sure what the other professions go through this, maybe politicians, but architects go through this quite often. Uh, I mean, I personally find it very shocking. So your architects go through what quite often, well, sorry? Well, this kind of, this, this uh, you know, uh, you are spending three years on a project and then something is cancelled. There's nothing I can do it because it's done by government, so I, there's nothing much I can do. Uh, you know, so um, I think it's, uh, I, find, I find it very shocking and non-camaraderie uh, behavior. So it sounds like you don't want to work in Japan again then? Uh, I still wear Japanese clothes. <laughs> I said to myself, I'm not going to wear Japanese again, but that's, that hasn't happened. Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think it's a great country, and, um, but I think in this case it was, I mean, nobody's going to know the truth, but I, I think it's, it's a bit obvious, actually. Um, if I could also ask you about, uh, from, from one stadium to another, um, so in Qatar. So you've done stellar work in making sure that no one is in danger on your site um, and you know, there's research has been done and studies conducted to make sure that uh, in the stadium building everyone's safe. Why aren't other people doing that for other stadia in Qatar? I don't know. Do you not think it's something that everyone should be I mean, doing? I don't think there's any accidents on the stadium in Qatar. I mean I think there is a kind of problem with, with people here and, and the Qataris, uh, although they allow the Qataris to buy half of London. <laughs> You know, that's okay. They have um, ambassadors and, you know, public political relations with them, diplomatic relations. But there's some sort of thing about the Qatari, uh, you know, 2020, whatever it is. Uh, you know, um, I mean, you know, I can, I can voice an opinion about the workers in many places. Well, I can go there and, I mean, you know, I'm not Angelina Jolie that to run around the planet uh, trying to, I mean, I can voice an opinion. Um, and I think that, I think to be fair to them, there has been no deaths in Qatar on the stadiums. So I'm not sure where this came from. There was, a, before that there was a demonstration about the workers in Abu Dhabi, you know. I'm sure there's a problem with workers in many places. You know, if it's not the, it's the, the housing problem, it's the things on site. I think, yes, I think it's important to make sure that these things are taken care of. I think it's very important that workers have very good living standards. And, you know, these countries are kind of wealthy, they can afford it. But, you know, I, 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 don't, have, I don't have the privilege to go around and, and check out all the quality of the housing in every country. Um, so just moving on to a, a final question from me before moving on to questions from the audience. So you said one of the main differences over the last 30 years of your, of your career is started off with 10 people and now it's 400. Does that, does that mean you're, you can't be as involved in every project as much as no, you'd like course, to? No, of it's, it's course, as I said, for me it's not the same, but no, I'm just saying it's a very different dynamic. You know, when you have a very good, very big team of people, I mean, it's a very different than if you have, we were more like a, like, a, like a very small unit. And of course, we couldn't do all the work we do now. Uh, you know, we can do one project at a time. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's quite different. So it's, 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 it's one project at a time? I mean, you know, I can't, I can't sit and do a, every line in every project. Sure. Uh, but I, I can, you know, I think I've taught for a long time. I also run the office for a long time, and I have very good people. I have Patrick Schumacher with me here, who's my partner in the office. I have some very good people who are with me for a long, very long time. And I don't have to spend a long time to explain to them everything. And also, it's not that, you know, as I said, it's not the master and the other people. It's, you know, it's more what we all bring to the table. As far as I'm concerned is that the effort of all the people involved in the teams is what matters. Uh, than, you know, the idea of one single person. I have, of course, the privilege of the right of veto. I can say I don't like it. I mean, people think I'm being very frivolous, but, uh, you know, but I don't like it means it's not right, as far as I'm concerned. And, but there's arguments all the time between especially me and the senior staff, and, and, and I think, but, but of course, you know, I always want to push the idea as far as possible to get a very good result. That's my ambition. I mean, I've 
spent a lot of time doing this because, not because there's some sort of, I mean, when I said art 30 years ago, I never thought I'll be one. No, no, you know, I'll, I'll do anything. I just, I was more, I really thought when I was in school that there was another way of doing things and that the church, and I believed in progress. And I think that if we do enough research and, and, and we, we can push the envelope and we can get better results. And that's what I was wanted to do. And, uh, and, and I think that the whole experience of my career through, through teaching and working and, you know, I do have like an, an office, although it's a professional office, but it's also a studio where we can explore our ideas. And I, that is what I'm doing it for. I'm, I mean, that's what, what I like about architecture. And, and I think we, a lot has been discovered in the last 30 years uh, through, you know, not through just computing, but through special research. And I think that uh, it's, it's been very exciting. Although heartbreaking, but. Well, thank you very much for answering my question. So I'll, well, I'll open up to questions from the floor. Um, and I purposely didn't mention one particular building in Oxford, because I'm sure there'll be questions oh, yes, from, from the floor on that. If we could please go for the member on the edge here. Yeah, that's right. Hello. Um, an honor to have you here in Oxford with us. Um, I have a question regarding the building um, that was just mentioned, the St. Anthony's building that you built um, here in Oxford. Um, I was wondering what role the, um, even though you said that sometimes it's not about imitating the surroundings, but the existing geometries. So I was wondering what role the existing geometries in the St. Anthony's College um, actually played uh, in the sort of building of the very uh, visually attractive, um, uh, you know, structure that you built. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I must say, you know, I have been to St. Anthony's College for uh, quite a few times before we were asked to do this project. And where is Eugene? Oh, Eugene is here. Eugene, uh, who is uh, the head of the college. Uh, also, my brother went to, went, was a fellow at, at St. Anthony's. So I used to visit and I gave a lecture there. Uh, my immediate reaction was to do, do a building which connects the two, the two projects together. So it was immediately kind of seen as a kind of a bridge. But of course, there was a tree that which could not touch. So but the advantage of this kind of work architecture is that it, it's, um, it's re response to the side by just a gentle bend of the bridge. That's why it's called a soft bridge. Uh, to the two buildings. Uh, that, that was really, um, so it was never seen as a building which would be imitating the two buildings, but a, an insertion of a new project, a new um, program into the college, which is just bending around the tree. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm looking for another question now. <coughs> if we could please go to uh, the member in the back in the, the black jacket. Hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming to Oxford. Um, my question is um, about uh, the extent to which you consider sustainability in your designing process, and also your thoughts on the inclusion of non-traditional urban building materials, like Adobe, for example, in the urban context. Thank you very much. Uh, Adobe, no, I know nothing about it. Patrick, you can ask. Well, this is the sustainability question. Well, I mean, I think that um, it's a very kind of, uh, a popular topic. <clears throat> I think it's very, I mean, I, I don't believe that sustainability could be achieved by, uh, you know, stone buildings and small windows. I think it's more important to really think about, in the sense, ingenuity of kind of the thermal device which you've designed the building for, you know, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't show it on the, with no images. Uh, so, of course, we do think about it, and also I think now, in terms of uh, cooling and air, you know heating, and in terms of the quality of the concrete, they all have to be uh, sustainable materials. But uh, I'm not sure what the, the other thing was. The material. Uh, non-traditional building materials. So the use of non-traditional materials. Like, like what? <laughs> like, like for example, um, designs that were used in the past, uh, like Adobe, for example, in the American Southwest um, or other regions. Thank you. I mean, I think that, you know, there has been an incredible, you know, advancement in material technology. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, in concrete or 
uh, in glass or fiber concrete or even you know like in wood. So there kind of a lot of advancement in material, material technology uh, and which can achieve whatever you want to do. I don't know the Adobe in the Southwest. What is that? I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he'll catch you afterwards to ask you. Um, but uh, if I may jump in with a question, at, at what stage does the, you know, what materials do we use come into the process? Uh, indeed, how does the whole process work from start to finish? Do you initially come up with the design? And well, I mean, I think now there's an, a sort of a, a, an interesting kind of thing between us and, and the engineers. Of course, you have to come with an idea, which, but you have to have an, the idea has to have some sort of uh, sensibility about structure. I mean, I, when I first started architecture, I, oh, I, for a while I went through this whole thing, with, I wanted everything to float around. I mean, I didn't want it to land, uh, but I knew that it would have to land, and therefore the way it landed was very important. And so the, the lightness of the way it landed, the, the, uh, the way the structure works, that it seems as if it's floating, was very important to, to my to the early work, and and so, uh, uh, but we, we work on it together. And also now that there has to be a very important structural element in the building, uh, so you have to know the logic of the of the structure. I mean, you're not an engineer, so the engineer will, will sort it out. But they work with us at the same time, and the same thing with the with the you know like the exterior, for example, in Baku where. The, uh, the whole structure was like a space frame and steel, kind of quite light, but cladded in concrete fiberglass, uh, which made it possible to have kind of this seamless, seamless texture and, and, and it would actually um, seamless all the way to the floor, although the material, there was a slight change from the material of the cladding to the floor, so it's non-slip. Uh, but it looks like a seamless, a seamless uh, material because it can allow, you can, this makes it very malleable and very sculptural because you want to do a building which looks like a, you know, a landscape and the idea of the boundaries are also discussed that there's, the, the boundary line is not so demarcated between the ground and the wall and therefore the, that material was very suitable. And in, in walls we did, we did use in situ concrete uh, and they had uh, invented a new thing called something like slow, what is it called? Self-compacting. Self-compacting. Self-compacting concrete, which is, to, which is dealing with kind of also round surfaces. So that was all in situ, which means you pour it on site. You don't, it's not prefabricated and brought on site. So they vary in, in the stations in Innsbruck. There were vacuum formed glass pieces that look like icicles. Um, so the structure, the base, the, the, the main structure is the ground is concrete, the superstructure, the uh, spe structure above is in steel and it's cladded with other materials. So you need to, uh, as an architect, have some idea of the logic of, this, of the engineering, but of course the engineers, like in the pool in London, uh, they work on the structure. But does that mean you're always learning when you find out about new materials? And yeah, you have to always kind of constantly learn. I mean, I don't know too much. I mean, I have lots of people doing this, and, but I think there are lots of people who are interested in fabrication. And I mean, of course, we also test ideas in fabrication and, and furniture and kind of milling technology, whether it's mill tables in aluminum or mills in, out of plexi or uh, vacuum formed, uh, you know, vacuum formed pieces. So, so all the, I mean, you have to understand, all the technology was to do with kind of autom uh, automobile autom uh, technology, making parts, uh, aircraft. All this actually now you can use in architecture, you know, and I think that that's what makes, uh, you know, makes it very, move away from the idea of, of repetition, like making flat panels repetitive. You can actually customize things for every single building. Thank you. Look for another question from the audience now. Um, if we could please go to the number just here. You mentioned your teaching activities several times and I started with you in Vienna and I think there's a lot of students here so I would love to hear some more about your teaching experience. What do you like about teaching? What do you get out of it? And also, how do you think architectural education would have to change? 
Well, I mean, I've taught for 30 years. I started, not continuously, I started teaching at day A, the year I finished the school, and I taught there for 10 years. And then I've been teaching in America, you know, at Yale, at Harvard, and Columbia. But I also had a, kind of visit, uh, a professorship in Vienna, which I just stopped this year, uh, for 15 years, which was a very, was a very uh, I mean, it was my most recent experience, and uh, it was a very exciting experience for me. Um, I don't know, I've always enjoyed teaching. I, I've taught with Patrick for many years, and, uh, and uh, people always think, you know, people always ask, people don't know, who, who don't, not in education, they always say, oh, you know, teaching because it gives you some ideas. Well, it, that's not really the reason you're teaching. I think it's a very reciprocal experience. And also, through teaching, you can, you can test certain ideas. It's not that you want to test them, it's not, they're not like a student's like guinea pigs, but you set in certain ideas which are very suitable in terms of education to test certain things. I don't believe only in a kind of, um, I believe in a, not only in a kind of a metaphysical project or metaphoric, but more uh, a project where it eventually could be achieved as a, as a building. And I think it was very important for me when I was a student that this idea of pushing certain ideas which seem quite extreme uh, to the mainstream uh, was the most important. So I think testing and these ideas in schools are, are very exciting and, and I, I believe also that people in the profession should also teach because there, there should not be this big gap between the student body and the profession. Uh, they're, not two, they're not necessarily two worlds. The realm of ideas and the realm of practice should be very similar or connected, and that's why I like teaching. Thank you for your question. Look for another question now um, from Lawrence. If we could please go to you, remember in the kind of light top. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering if you ever got the equivalent, uh, the architect's equivalent of writer's block, where you don't feel like your heart's fully in a project, and um, how do you overcome that personally? Oh, yeah, it always happens. Uh, well, I, I think about a project all the time. Uh, and so, I, when I was a student, yes, of course, you're sitting on a desk and you blanked out and you don't know what to do. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't find it so difficult now. I, you have to just keep on at it. I mean, uh, the exercise of um, sketching in your mind, not only by your hand, um, is a, is a practice, you know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, practicing the violin or whatever, whatever it is. Any skill you achieve is through practice, I think, and you just, even thinking about a, a topic is through practice. Interesting that you just said you're always thinking about a project. Does that make it difficult to switch off? Do you yeah, even I want to switch off? No, I, I don't switch off. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, you know, um, you know so it's there all the time. Thank you for your question. It uh, doesn't mean that I don't have fun, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> While you're having fun, you're still thinking about it. Yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Um, if we can now look for, uh, if we go just here in the gray uh, jumper, just on the edge here. Uh, you're currently designing a project of mass housing in Mexico. So how do you convince the real estate developer there that uh, they had plans to build high-rise uh, towers, but it ended up with uh, you designing high-density, low-rise, low-cost housing there. So what's your thought process in convincing the developer in almost changing the product mix that he or she had conceptualized for that site? I know Monterey. Monterey? Yeah, Monterey. Monterey. You answer the question, buddy. <laughs> you might be know, knowing more about this one than we. Uh, we, in terms of the uh, the idea of high rise, I mean. Uh, no, no, I mean the the owner of that land was looking to build high rise, but by now, uh, the Zahadi firm is designing uh, low rise and high density uh, units there. So, what what's yeah, the we, thought process in changing? Well, I mean, the we did a we did a scheme. I mean, I didn't know he wanted a high rise. <laughs> You know, Nobody we told us. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 uh, we, we looked at the site and we created a scheme which we, we thought was 
uh, uh, creating interesting set of exterior spaces and garden spaces and public spaces. And we worked with a series of slabs. I wouldn't call them low rise. They're still quite high, but they're long slabs and create a very animated, beautiful scene in the background of a beautiful landscape, actually. But uh, yeah, we, nobody told us that this guy wanted uh, towers. <laughs> Well, thank you for your question, um, and wherever you're getting your information from is clearly good. Um, but thank you. If we could look for another question. No, but there's another problem with my office. They, they don't tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> Hide from her everything. I imagine it's quite difficult to keep everything from <laughs> her. Um, all right, thank you for your question. If we could please go uh, right to the back in the corner. Thanks. Hi. Do you have any projects or buildings that have a particularly personal significance for you that you've done in the past? No, I think that the project we're doing in Iraq would be personally interesting for me. Uh, you know, and I think that all the projects interest me, but I think going, for example, if we ever get to do the parliament in Iraq, that would be quite significant for me. Thank you for your question. Um, if we could now look uh, just uh, here on the end. Um, I was just wondering what advice would you give to an aspiring architect who wanted to go into the industry? Have they started? Has this person started yet? Um, I mean, no, uh, there's before studying architecture in the middle of architecture? Or? Um, let's say you were studying architecture at university and then you wanted to, after some experience, go into the industry. What advice would you give? Well. I think, is that your person, you? <laughs> uh, it's a, sorry, it's a friend, it's a friend. No? It's a friend. Uh, it's a friend of yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, um, well, I think, first of all, do the best this person should do, the best they can while they're in school. And, and, and then find the best office which they can relate to, go there and get experience. And uh, I mean, there is no, there is no real magic. It's, it's really hard work. And if you want to do well as an architect, you have to work hard. I mean, I don't know anyone else who, I mean, we all spend long hours, you know, doing what we do. So that's, that's the only, that's the only advice I can give. You know, see the world, travel, read, look around. There is precedent and, you know, I think that's it. So that, that would suggest you get your inspiration from all sorts of things? Well, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, for example, when we were students, we used to tr go on what they call unit, unit trips. They would take you on a trip to somewhere. <coughs> it's funny, interesting, when I was at the AA, Architectural Association. It started off with by going to like Paris or Rome to look at buildings. Then the school became so kind of esoteric. I really went to landscape. They would take them to strange, the strangest places in the world. But they were still very inspiring. So I think inspiration is very important. Uh, you know, uh, looking at things which, I mean, I, you know, my first trip to New York uh, was, was amazing, you know, because I suddenly realized a lot of the ideas one had, they had already been done and to know how they had done them. And so that was very exciting. You know, I mean, I went in my early kind of career, I went to Brazil because I also then found out what are the best work in, in that modernist period which was done, whether it's Brazil or Germany or whatever. So you see these things are all very expanding as a kind of a sort of part student. Russia, for me, going to on a trip to Moscow and St. Petersburg, not only because the work that was of the various periods was very exciting, uh, you know, the place was so weird. I mean, it was, we had the weirdest experiences of our lives in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I mean, it was just the most bizarre. It's like going to North Korea now. It would be equally strange. Uh, going to East Berlin and when the wall was there, uh, you know, was crazy. 
But I mean, my first trip to China was in 81, before it completely opened up. So all these things are, you know, I mean, the Chinese trip to me was a very seminal experience because I was, before that I wasn't so interested in landscape. After China, I was very interested in landscape and also the way they manipulated, for example, the Chinese garden. It might not look like Chinese garden in my work, but it was very influenced by that trip. So I think research in all these different ways, you know, always helps, helps you. Make sure you tell your friend. Um, yeah, tell your friend. <laughs> yeah, look for another question now, please. If we could go uh, to the member in the glasses here. Yeah, you know, bearing in mind that most of your buildings are defined by the uh, advancements in technology nowadays, and they use a lot of uh, computing advancements in bearing structures in other architects, very famous. They don't use that as much, say, for instance, Peter Sumtor. And I think that is a very in tune of nowadays culture. How would you say that your architecture will be reviewed by future architecture historians as, as characteristic of our time? I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> or, or do you think that your architecture is, is going to be the, um, when people look back, is like what our time, the legacy of our time? Because I think it's, it's, if, you, if you see it today, is a lot of it is defined by technology. And I think that your buildings have a lot of technology or are a product to a certain extent of technology. So I think that is, uh, there are more in tune of other arch architecture out there. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a flattering question, but, uh, but and if it was rhetorical, I agree with you that uh, our work would be seen as of our time and the representing of our time and be part of architectural history, whereas some of the other work which is, could have been done 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 40 years ago, would not be counted and considered, because I think the history of architecture is only the history of innovations and key radical innovations, and they count, and everything else will be forgotten. So, so I think that's, that's something to reflect on. I think we believe in progress and architecture is not excluded from this. Sometimes people think it's something which is more eternal and more, more timeless, but it's also of our time and as society evolves, the built environment needs to evolve with that and needs to innovate and be adapted with, with respect to <coughs> new dynamics and also utilizing on the opportunities of new technologies. So we strongly believe in that, and, uh, but it's still an embattled approach. And there are still others and many others who, who, who don't think so. I mean, I, for example, if, you know, to reflect on that question, uh, if you look at what's happening in London now, it's, it is a, a, a tragedy that the work that's going on there could have been done in the 60s, you know, w without any of the current knowledge and advancement in technology. And, and, and I think that's a real shame that if you, if you survey what's happening, it, it's, it's a bit strange. Thank you. Um, if you look for uh, another question, please. Uh, there's someone kind of waving um, there. Hi. Um, I was wondering to which extent has suprematism defined your work? So can you repeat that question, please? To which extent has suprematism defined your work? Uh, a great deal. Uh, I mean, my first influence uh, was uh, Russian avant-garde and uh, suprematism, and I think through that, I uh, the influence the early work in terms of kind of fragmentation and flotation and liberation from from gravity. And uh, but I think the fundamental thing was the breaking of the system, and uh, so uh, and, and composition. The idea of the open composition was really stemmed from suprematism. Thank you for your question. Um, if we could please come uh, down here. Oh, thank you for coming to Oxford. I like the design of the Tokyo Olympic Stadium. Um, could you hear, um, you know, you point out that the current design of the Tokyo Olympic Stadium is similar to, uh, interior design is very similar to your design. Um, breaching the intellectual right is a very huge issue. Could you tell me about your opinion about uh, this um, kind of issue? 
I think there is a problem of copyright. I think there is a problem of copyright. What we'll do about it, I don't know yet, but I think there's a problem. I, I believe in, I mean, you know, I think that um, when something is duplicated, it's a copyright issue. There are, in architecture, unfortunately, you can't always do much about people copy it and, you know, there's not much you can do about it. I mean, you can do that with design. If you, somebody copies a chair, you can do that with photography, you can do that with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with any item. Uh, an architecture can just change one item, but I think in this case there is a, there is a copyright issue. Thank you for your question. We have a uh, final couple of questions from the audience. Um, so if we could go to the member there who I'm currently looking at, if you keep your hand up. Hi. Um, I was wondering, considering that more and more people are moving to cities at a sort of unsustainable rate at the moment, I was wondering what sort of problems you think architects are going to have to come over in the, in the coming years and in the future? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, the cities are getting more congested and there is a kind of uh, an issue of hybrid density. Uh, but I think it, it's not, a, I don't think it's a necessarily a very big problem. I mean, we have to deal with it. I think the thing which has to be dealt with is the cities, like the, how deal with the streets and transportation and, you know, these are problematic. Um, and I think the, in the historic city, it's very difficult to, you know, like demolish and make streets, but I think there has to be a way of dealing with, with hyper, dense, hyper, hyper density. I mean, I, you know, there was a move in the, like 20, 30 years ago, to go out into the green fields and expand in the city. And there was now a reversal of that. And I think that another thing which is happening uh, is that people, especially the young people, want to be in the, in the city, they want to be in active spaces, they want to go to the cinema, they want to go to the museum, they want to go to a concert, they want to go out. I mean, I'm sure it's the same in Oxford, but in London, you know, the amount of eateries and bars and restaurants are massive everywhere. So the urbanism has extended from central London to all the areas kind of around it. So you can see this, uh, this kind of desire to be in the city. And therefore, I think you have to accommodate. I mean, if I talk about London specifically, where it's very low rise, you can think of a much higher density, higher rise city. The ambition now is to do in London high density, low rise, which means there is no absolute gaps. There's no open space, there's no uh, public domain, there's no public areas, because it's all very squashed in. Uh, so I think that one has to kind of think of a, of a much more kind of transparent high-rise to allow for some sort of breathing space on the ground. Thank you for your question. We'll look for a final question now, please. Um, if we could come to uh, the member at the back row there. Thank you. Um, what do you consider sorry, uh, the most challenging part of designing an opera house or a performing arts centre in, in general, I suppose? Uh, well, we've done, we've done quite a few opera houses. The first experience, of course, was not a very happy one, which was in Cardiff. Uh, but I, it was really the challenge was the acoustics, how to design a very uh, kind of energized acoustic space, and how do you, uh, how would the, the, the theater or the opera would seem, uh, how do you place it within the context of the city? So there are kind of various ways of doing it, but I think acoustically, I would say that would be the most challenging part. Because, you know, it was always, there's a whole issue and discussion in, in, in opera, whether symmetry is the best or is symmetry. And, you know, I think that kind of, one can test that out in, in the theatre. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. Um, but Zaha, thank you very much mm, for coming. Pleasure. If you could thank all please you. remain seated as Zaha leaves the chamber, but please join me in thanking once again James Zaha Hadid. <laughs>